Tonight, another day of delays for weary travelers after a system-wide failure grounded planes across the U.S. I think this is my fourth delay right now, so just kind of waiting it out. How it happened and the repercussions here. California digging out a muddy, deadly mess. It was scary because it was so close and the downpour was nonstop, nonstop. And it's not over yet. Oh. 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 It's meant to treat type 2 diabetes, so why are people using this drug for weight loss? You know, these are medicines. They're not harmless uh, candies that people take. A closer look at the risks and the potential. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. After weeks of airport chaos and disruption across the United States that travelers hoped was finally over, a bitter surprise today, it's not over. This time it wasn't the weather, but a major computer system failure that grounded thousands of flights early this morning, sending shockwaves through the entire U.S. travel network. Here's Katie Simpson on what happened and what's being done to fix this latest mess. There is something eerie about this kind of stillness at an airport. Normally busy runways across the U.S. remained empty, while some passengers who'd already boarded planes were forced back into terminals, kicking off an exhausting day of travel for hundreds of thousands of people. I think this is my fourth delay right now, so just kind of waiting it out, hoping to get on a flight and get home. The FAA halted domestic departures for about 90 minutes because of a problem with its messaging system that delivers safety alerts to pilots. Trouble with the program started on Tuesday, and while it was resolved, the cause is still under investigation. There is no direct indication of any kind of external or nefarious activity, but we are not yet prepared to rule that out. The interruption caused thousands of cancellations and delays, which could take days to sort out. It only adds to the frustration of U.S. air travelers who navigated an absolute gong show over the holidays caused by a combination of severe weather and technical problems with Southwest Airlines. I think they need to do something better for sure because I know a lot of people have been affected if they're trying to get to business meetings or if they have people in the hospital or funerals, things like that. So something I think truly needs to be done. The FAA is now under pressure to build a more robust messaging system to prevent this from happening again. Having a backup system is very important all the time uh, because it, it prevent or shorten the downtime of your system. But the agency is being praised for erring on the side of caution. So from your perspective, the FAA made the right call in putting safety first. It's always the right call, yeah, safety come first in the aviation industry. And Katie, I gathered tonight the FAA is finally revealing what might have caused this. Yeah, the FAA says all of this may have been caused by a damaged database file. In other words, a computer problem. CNN is reporting that officials thought the best solution would be to reboot the system. But, of course, that reboot did not go as planned and we witnessed the aftermath and all of the cancellations and delays. Things here at Reagan National Airport, they are extremely calm, and passengers we spoke with were pretty understanding, which is surprising given how many travel schedules were upended. Adrian. Yeah, you bet. Katie Simpson at Reagan National in Virginia. Thank you. Now, that outage did have a ripple effect here in Canada, but it could have been worse. At Toronto's Pearson International Airport, about a third of outbound flights experienced early morning delays, most heading to the States. There were a handful of cancellations, but nothing major. Other airports reported just a few minor disruptions. And Canada's air hazard notification system also experienced a disruption today. Officials say Canada's NOTAM computer system just stopped working properly for a few hours before coming back online. No flights were disrupted, and officials say this wasn't related to a cyber attack, and they don't think it was connected to the U.S. outage. Well, this is the scene out of California tonight after relentless, powerful storms. The damage is extensive. At least 18 people have been killed, and there's mud. Lots and lots of mud. Mercifully, there was a bit of a break in the weather for the southern part of the state. It's a chance to assess all that destruction before the next downpour. While the situation is bad, lessons learned from previous disasters may help mitigate this one. Susanna Da Silva is in Santa Barbara tonight with the people living through it.
I've never seen the water um, moving that fast. This creek normally doesn't run very high, if at all. That changed on Monday and fast. The backyard started filling in, so the water was filling in. I kind of was trying to take buckets and clear it out over here, but I figured it was filling in so quickly. Kylie McCoy soon realized she had to get out, but by then the intersection in front of her house looked like this. Now the cleanup, but she isn't sure if there's any point in starting yet. I just see this as the aftermath of the climate crisis um, and that these emergencies are bec becoming more and more frequent and more and more, you know, um, impactful. I just feel kind of scared and, and anxious um, for what's to come. It was scary because it was so close and the downpour was nonstop, nonstop. A fear especially felt by those living on the street. Tanya Austin says it has been a struggle to stay warm, dry and safe. People think maybe we have less to lose because we don't have anything, but mm, the little things we do have, um, the thought of losing them is it's pretty scary. While there is a lot of cleanup to do, officials say infrastructure improvements after previous disasters prevented it from being even worse. All of this that you see here uh, came off of these mountains in within a 24-hour period. This hill used to be filled with homes. They were bought by the county after the deadly mudslides in 2018. This basin completed in October. The purpose of this is to catch the, um, the mud, the debris, the rocks and the mud and keep it from clogging our creeks and allowing the water to flowly, uh, freely flow into, into the, towards the ocean, right? And for the most part, it really did do its job. Northern California was the focus of today's storm, and in San Miguel, the search continues for five-year-old Kyle Doan, who was swept away by floodwaters on Monday. Oh, what a shame. So, Susie, uh, more storms clearly in the forecast. What's your sense of how people are preparing? Yeah, well, where we are here, actually, you can see behind me there's sand. There are sandbags. There have been firefighters here all day long filling these up, encouraging people to come here and get ready for this weekend. Also, what's happening, actually, as we speak, are more members of the National Guard from California are arriving. They say they're ready to be deployed for whatever is needed. That is reassuring for residents who say they saw the damage on Monday. They don't want to take any chances. There is more rain expected this weekend. Storms that are not supposed to be as bad as earlier in this week. But, of course, you have saturated ground infrastructure that's already riding at the highest levels, and people are worried. Adrian. All right, Susanna De Silva in Santa Barbara tonight. Thank you. CBC News has learned that a record number of people in Edmonton had limbs or fingers or toes amputated last winter, winter life-changing injuries because of frostbite. The winter wasn't especially harsh, but as Julie Wong explains, there were a lot more people living on the streets. Lori Lynn Descoto was already an amputee when she lost part of her other leg in November to frostbite. There's something called phantom pain that you get when you um, lose your leg. That's not something I don't wish on my worst enemy. She says she could not find a space at a shelter, so she slept outside in freezing temperatures, encountering an outreach worker the next day. She didn't want to tell me that, you know, that my toes were black. You know, I, I, know, I knew what that meant, that, you know, it, I was going to have to have an amputation. Aid. Descoto is not alone. Numbers obtained by CBC News through a Freedom of Information request show 91 Edmontonians had frostbite amputations last winter, more than double any other year in the last decade, and surpassing other, colder winters. The overarching theme is undoubtedly homelessness. Um, the vast, vast majority of these individuals were unhoused. What we're seeing is a human rights catastrophe. This housing expert says amputation numbers spiked as Edmonton's homeless population soared. It's such a failure of our housing system that so many people cannot access housing, uh, that they're living in, in tents and encampments where they're exposed to this level of risk. Those who work with the vulnerable are trained in frostbite and know what happens if it is not prevented. Amputations are an example of how homelessness and poverty compound your already existing challenges. It, it, it's how they reinforce the cycle of poverty. As for Descoto, she's coming to terms with another challenge. I knew how to, I knew how to uh, be very independent with that one leg, but now having both of them gone, it's another 360 in my life.
The worry is more people could face this injury as the homeless population continues to climb and Alberta's winter is far from over. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. In another signal, more Canadians are struggling. The country's largest food rescue organization says the demand for food banks is spiraling. Second Harvest surveyed organizations across the country. 70% say they need both more food and more funding to meet the demand. The food bank surveyed facing a total shortfall this year of nearly $100 million. Lisa Shing shows us the hunger and what's driving it. The work doesn't stop after this food bank closes. So we are uh, unloading crackers and chips for clients that just came in from Second Harvest. As volunteers, many of them clients themselves, prepare for another day of long lineups. It's very hard to find a job, but without job, a uh, food bank is a very good uh, option for needy people. They're seeing triple the number of people compared with three years ago. Are you seeing a lot of new faces? A lot of new faces, yes. Of all, all the ethnicities, everything, yes. Our lineups you will see outside when we open, it's two blocks down sometimes, you know. The problem is nationwide. Food rescue charity Second Harvest collected data from 1,300 organizations. It found demand for food banks will grow by 60% this year. That's on top of a 134% increase last year. A lot of people that are accessing food supports have jobs. These are not, these are families that just can't make it and they, they could be two parent families and they have jobs. A number of factors are playing into this increase in need. The end of COVID supports, food inflation and the fact wages can't keep up all play a role. There are so many pressures on families right now and individuals on how do you best spend your money. And the truth is food is really your only negotiating product. Researchers say food banks offer short-term emergency help, not a long-term fix. The more effective um, solution would be a, a, a guaranteed livable basic income that puts an income floor under everybody, something that's tied to cost of living in different areas, which we have the data, we can do that. A costly solution perhaps, but one advocates say would ease the burden on grassroots organizations. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. An investigation is underway in B.C. into a Mountie whose opinions are being called inappropriate. As Brady Strachan explains, this is raising concerns about discrimination within the force. Hello and welcome to the Church of Trudeau. My name is Father B. This is one of several videos from RCMP officer Brent Lord's webpage. It was taken down late last year, but content obtained by CBC News shows Lord dressed up in outlandish costumes in what appears to be satirical political commentary. Our religion teaches the importance of socialism, of cancelling everything that offends anyone. In the videos, Lord mocks funding to LGBTQ plus and Indigenous communities, as well as the Prime Minister and immigration policy. I will say, welcome to Canada. Shake, shake, shake. Vote Liberal. Lord doesn't mention his role with the RCMP on the website, but his content has caused quite a stir in Trail, a community of about 8,000 people in southern BC. If it's somebody that's, you know, in a position of power, uh, you would be concerned if they are feeling the need to spread those views. I don't think they should be uh, able to say what they want. I mean, they're uh, supposed to be a trusted uh, members of our community. The website and the views expressed on it are also not going over well at the RCMP detachment. The RCMP ordered him to work from home late last year while it launched an investigation. Staff members are very disappointed in the messaging coming out as it does not reflect who they are and they do not support the messaging. BC's former Solicitor General says the website is an example of a growing problem in policing and likens it to officers who spoke out publicly in favour of the Freedom Convoy. He says it's a matter of public trust if officers can serve the public without bias. The RCMP actually lost a lot of credibility in the way they reacted to that and the lack of being proactive in trying to deal with it. CBC News has repeatedly reached out to Lord for comment, but he has not responded. The RCMP says he is now on a leave of absence. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Kelowna. 
U.S. President Joe Biden faces more questions tonight after reports he had more improperly stored classified documents. According to people briefed on the matter, aides have now found a total of two batches of classified documents at two locations and returned them to the National Archives. Republicans are outraged by what they say is a double standard. Former President Donald Trump faces a special counsel investigation after hundreds of classified documents were found in an FBI raid on his Florida resort. Also in the U.S., angry calls for embattled Congressman George Santos to resign are now coming from senior Republicans in his own New York district. Santos has been under siege for weeks for making up huge parts of his life story, but so far his message remains the same. I'm not leaving. Here's Paul Hunter. Congressman Santos, will you resign? I will not. U.S. Congressman George Santos. I will not. Guys, we're guys, we're and yet more pointed humiliation. The New York Republicans are calling you a disgrace. You will not resign. What is your response to New York Republicans? Saved by the elevator this time, the newly sworn in Republican lawmaker is under constant fire. Branded an unapologetic serial liar since reports he'd indeed lied about his connection to the Holocaust and 9-11, about his ancestry, income, education, his own mother's death. It's made him a staple of late night TV mockery. All of it now leading to Santos's fellow Republicans in New York saying, enough already. It is simply tragic and outrageous and disgusting. It is a great stain on the Republican Party of Nassau County. We were all duped and we're appalled and angered at how George Santos misled us, lied to us, and what a fraud he actually is. In a remarkable step, they each then Anthony. all but pleaded, it's time to step down and calling for George Santos to resign. This man must resign immediately. All of it potential trouble for Republicans in Washington. Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy now George rules Santos out Santos prominent Santos. roles for Santos. George Santos. But that's as far as he's gone. His victory once seen as among the Republican highlights of the midterm elections. The question for his party now, what to do about George Santos? tweeted Santos tonight to his critics, go cry about it. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Police in Paris are hunting for a motive after a man attacked passengers with a homemade blade at one of Europe's busiest train stations. Six people are recovering from injuries tonight after the attack at Gare du Nord. The suspect was shot by off-duty officers who happened to be at the scene he is now in hospital. The case is not currently being treated as a terror attack. Well, tonight there is a win for Canadian auto parts manufacturers. An arbitration panel has ruled in favor of Canada and Mexico in a trade dispute with the U.S. David Cochran shows us the implications for Canada. The Prime Minister offering the personal touch at an event to promote trade, speaking to Mexican business leaders about the merits of their continental partnership. It wasn't just Canada that won. NAFTA was never a zero-sum game. It was always win-win-win. Or, in some cases, win-win-lose. Mexico and Canada have won a trade dispute with the U.S., settling a disagreement over rules of origin for auto parts. Our supply chains are deeply integrated. This is an important decision, and uh, we're very pleased with uh, the outcome. Had the U.S. won, Canadian parts producers would be forced to use fewer components from Asia, driving up costs and making them less competitive, potentially costing them jobs and contracts. This is very important for parts makers all over North America, Canada, U.S., and Mexico. But Canadian automotive uh, suppliers employ about 100,000 people here, and it's a very big relief for those people. News of this ruling leaked in December, but it wasn't released publicly until now, one day after the U.S. president left the summit in Mexico City, avoiding an awkward setback for the president at a summit about working together. And so this summit ends with a shared victory for Canada and Mexico, one centered on the industry at the very heart of the Canada-U.S.-Mexico trade agreement. David Cochran, CBC News, Mexico City.
One of the most influential rock guitarists of all time has died. Jeff Beck was 78. Well, beginning in the 60s, the British musician redefined guitar music. His style would influence genres from heavy metal to jazz. He once said, I play the way I do because it allows me to come up with the sickest sounds possible. His family announced he died suddenly after a short battle with meningitis. Well, a debate over gas stoves has been reignited. If there is a danger of asthma, maybe a gas stove's not for you. But should they be banned outright? And a new TikTok trend has people flocking for a diabetes drug. It's about 360 pounds. The new supposed weight loss solution, but is it safe to use? We've seen it happen many times where uh, there were these heralded wonder drugs. And treasure hunters stumble on an unusual and unexpected find. It's pretty amazing to actually have found this without any map. The hotel history buried in the woods. They always tease the story. They're like, be sure to come back for the quirky story. He said it, not us. We're back in two. U.S. investment bank Goldman Sachs will lay off just over 3,000 employees this week. That's about 6% of staff. The cost-cutting measure is aimed at reducing expenses in a slowing economy. The debate over gas stoves is heating up again. It was reignited by a recent study linking their pollutants to childhood asthma. As Allison Northcott explains, an outright ban is not in the cards, but there is growing pressure to address the health risks. Samantha Gold has used a gas stove for years. And I honestly, I can't imagine living without a gas stove now. It's so convenient. But there are growing concerns about their safety due to emissions and a U.S. study linking them to an increased risk of asthma in children. In the U.S., a commissioner with the consumer watchdog set off alarm bells, suggesting a ban on gas stoves was an option. But the Consumer Product Safety Commission chair later clarified that's not the plan. Still, here in Canada, researchers say gas stoves do come with risks. Gas stoves pollute the indoor air. They make your air quality worse. We don't know if that will affect you. This researcher has studied pollutants from gas stoves. And the reason that I eventually managed to switch to an induction stove uh, was that, you know, if you, it's just easier to choose not to pollute the air indoors. But some are skeptical about links to asthma. But I don't want parents to uh, assume today that using the gas stove at home is risking their children immediately. And ventilation, monitoring, and servicing those devices is really going to be important. Health Canada says kitchen exhaust fans and ventilation can reduce indoor air pollutants from gas stoves. And the Canadian Gas Association says gas appliances adhere to strict rules and regulations. Still, Tim Grant wants people in his neighbourhood to get rid of their gas stoves. He organized a bulk buying deal to replace them. Carbon emissions are the driver of uh, climate change. And to the extent that we can help uh, reduce those emissions, uh, you know, all the better. Samantha Gold says it's important to weigh the options. And if there is a danger of asthma, maybe a gas stove's not for you. But at the end of the day, I think consumers should have a choice. She plans to stick with her stove a little longer. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Girl Guides of Canada has announced a new branch name for girls age 7 and 8. It hopes it will create a more inclusive space for girls. So the new name is Embers. Last year, the organization said it would stop using brownies to remove barriers for those who felt racialized. In a statement, the CEO said by changing the name, we're showing girls that what they say matters. The change is effective immediately. Well, the social media trend is putting a spotlight on a drug that makes a pretty big claim. And you may lose weight. The hype behind a weight loss drug, but what are the drawbacks? I can understand why people want to believe that there's a quick and easy solution. And comparing Canada's cell phone bill with other parts of the world. Oh my God. 
God. That's, that's so much money. CBC's marketplace digs into the shocking difference. We can't fault them for that. We have to have the government step in and fix this once and for all. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. Basically, it helps um, suppress your appetite so that you can lose weight a lot faster. I lost 52 pounds over the year uh, that I've been on it. Well, as the new year begins, so do the aspirations of many people to lose weight. There is, it seems, a new trend out there. So it's actually a drug designed to help people with type 2 diabetes, but Thanks to influencers on social media, it's now in high demand for people looking to just shed some pounds. Christine Birak looks at its growing popularity and the potential downside. My goal weight is 135 pounds. Between the hype on social media and the relentless TV ads, questions are swirling around this type 2 diabetes medication. And you may lose weight. So how well does it work for weight loss and who should be taking it? This is an important medication for us because it changed the entire playing field. I really like this idea. Dr. The, uh... Sean Wharton specializes in diabetes and weight management. He emphasizes obesity is a complex medical problem, not a moral failing. Aside from bariatric surgery, there's been no highly effective treatment. Wharton studied Ozempic for the drug maker. Studies funded mostly by Novo Nordisk found, in combination with a low-calorie diet and exercise, 86% of people on the drug lost between 5 and 15% of their body weight after a year. Over the past five years only, we've had this new field of medication that really works. Patients are finally getting some relief from this medical condition that has plagued them for a long time. It is gratifying to see uh, widespread uh, knowledge now surrounding these medicines. Of course, that comes with a concern. In scientific circles, Dr. Daniel Drucker is a big deal. His work laid the foundation for this new field of diabetes and weight loss medications using the drug semaglutide. It works through receptors on cells. Semaglutide tricks the brain. It mimics a hormone that regulates hunger and food intake. It slows down the emptying of the stomach so people feel fuller longer, potentially leading to weight loss. But studies also showed side effects, including stomach pain, vomiting, and fatigue. The drug also increases the risk of suicidal behavior and thyroid cancer. These are medicines. They're not harmless candies that people take. And medicines can have side effects and need to be used appropriately. Doctors also note the weight only stays off as long as you keep taking the drug. I can understand why people want to believe that there's a quick and easy solution, but it's not there. Dr. Nav Prasad says fad diets also offer quick weight loss that doesn't last, and he warns diet drugs have come and gone. We've seen it happen many times uh, where uh, there were these heralded wonder drugs that turned out not to work or to harm or kill people. In France, a diet drug that started as a type 2 diabetes treatment is now being blamed for thousands of deaths due to heart valve problems. Other drugs have had similar problems. Some, including endocannabinoids, have led to psychiatric side effects, including suicides. I got to the point where I was about 360 pounds. Uh, I was hypertensive, had severe sleep apnea. Ian Patton works for Obesity Canada, which receives money from Novo Nordisk. He's been taking Ozempic for two years and has lost about 50 pounds. Patton says for him, the benefits of easing other obesity-related problems outweighs the risk from the drug, but... It's not something that someone should be taking to lose that 10 pounds before they go, you know, for their wedding or their beach vacation. This is for people who are sick. So, Christine, I I'm going to presume that this is an injectable drug? That's right. So, Ian, whom we just heard from, injects himself with it once a week, and it costs about $250 a month. But keep in mind, as we mentioned, if you want to keep that weight off, you have to take this drug for the rest of your life. So, it becomes a larger expense. And also, there's no studies that have been done for anyone taking this drug for the rest of their life and the effect on their overall health. 
So, so what do people need to watch for next in terms of you know, making a, an actual informed decision about this? Well, I think it really is the research. A lot of the research has been done on people with diabetes, and the overall safety profile for them is good. We haven't seen what it does in people with obesity for very long. There is a study that's being done. It's uh, set to come out this summer, the results of it, and, and people are hopeful. The dosage is different. People with diabetes get a lower dose than people with obesity. Um, and I should emphasize, though, there are studies happening for people with obesity. Doctors say there are no studies for people who are just taking this drug to lose a few pounds, to go to an event, and for them, the risks far outweigh the benefits. Okay, this is always good to know. Christine, thank you. You're welcome. This is the time of year when people find their feeds inundated with weight loss trends. How do you get to the truth of those claims? Which ones work? Do any of them? Timothy Caulfield is a pseudoscience myth buster who knows all this kind of stuff. He's also the Canada Research Chair in Health Law and Policy and a professor at the University of Alberta. So Timothy, thank you for joining us. As a tea drinker, this one in particular is all over my feeds, the supposed magic of green tea. Let's listen to this. When you want to lose weight, there are very limited drinks you can consume. Green tea is one of the best drinks out of that few. Green tea, one of the best out of the few. Uh, the green tea diet, does it make any sense? Uh, no, <laughs> it doesn't. There's a short answer, and it's often associated with the word cleanse and detox. I don't know if you've seen that, too. Uh, really, first of all, if you see detox or cleanse, that's a big red flag uh, to ignore. Look, tea is healthy. Um, there's this growing body of evidence that suggests it has health benefits. And yes, there have been some studies to suggest that that green tea has some metabolic properties that might help weight loss. But look, the benefit is so, so small. And I think this is a good example of the reality that, that there is no superfood. There is no magical supplement that's going to work. And green tea is in that category. Hey, if you enjoy it, fantastic. It's not a magical solution. OK, you're starting to break my heart. Uh, let's take a listen now <laughs> to someone else who's touting uh, the, the keto diet. So why would someone even want to do a keto diet? The simple answer is fabulous. When people try keto diets, they lose weight. Uh, so I wanted to listen to more of him, right? Because I, I, I think some of these ads are very compelling. And this is one of those diets I know a lot of our audience have heard a lot about, maybe tried it themselves. What does the science say about it? Well, there's a little more nuance with this one. Yeah, there have actually been clinical trials on this to explore how beneficial it might be. So let's just focus on the weight loss aspect of the story. Uh, the long term, so if you're looking long term, it, it's not impressive. The data is not impressive. It's messy, but it's not impressive. People sometimes have short term benefit. And I think that that's why people think, oh, this works. In other words, they lose weight. Uh, in the short term, but long term, and of course, that's the key, <laughs> that's the key, there doesn't seem to be any magical performance. And the other thing that's important here is if you go on an extreme version of this, like the ancestral, like the liver king, for example, eating raw liver uh, and nothing else, there could be some nutritional issues also, you know, not enough fiber, not enough fruits and vegetables. So uh, I'm going to put this in the category of of no magic, uh, there is some benefit, perhaps short term, tough to, to maintain long term, but I think we need more data long term, uh, but it's not going to be the miraculous cure that, that everyone's hoping for. So people hear keto, and it's, I, I realize we're talking about it as if everyone knows what we're talking about, but of course some people won't. What, you know, what, what's a dime store version of what it means? Well, keto is one of those diets that focuses on, focuses on a macronutrient, and here we're talking protein. So the idea is we should be eating more protein, almost all protein for the extreme version of it, uh, and that that's going to have a metabolic benefit. And there's some interesting research about that in particular context and also help you lose weight. But the interesting thing here is there is some theory that it helps with your appetite, right? As compared to eating carbohydrates, uh, makes you feel more, more full. And, and that might be why you see that short term benefit. But again, whenever you're talking about weight loss, you have to look long term. And the other thing you have to look at is, is it can you maintain this? OK, let's take one last look at, at intermittent fasting, this idea that you go for long periods of time without eating. Many studies have shown that intermittent fasting improves people's health and helps in losing weight. Again, you know, one of those trends that people may have tried, maybe on the verge of trying this new year, what do they need to know about, about it, really? 
Well, this is a, a super popular one right now. People, a lot of people feel really strongly uh, about this one. And, and I think this of the three is the most, is kind of the most interesting. We, we have seen a lot of clinical trials emerge. Uh, and again, just focusing on weight loss, because there's another st a story with intermittent fasting about metabolism and, and, and dealing with other health issues. But let's focus on weight loss. And by and large, it's the same story as keto. Long term, it looks like it doesn't outperform other other diets. And look, you know, I, I I'm a uh, science policy person. I try to get look at this very holistically. And for example, there's a study that was in New England Journal of Medicine uh, in April of last year, 2022, and it found it did not perform better than calorie restriction over 12 months for weight loss purposes. Um, but if this is a diet that works for you, this is how you want to take your calories, you find it easier to do a calorie, calorie restriction using the fasting model, then perhaps that is something you might want to think about. And of course, what you want to do is you want to talk to your family physician about what's best for you. Always the best advice. Tim, thank you. Thanks so much. And worth repeating, consult your family doctor if you're planning on trying these or any other weight loss trends that are popping up on your feet. So while we're talking about food, listen to this. That yeast you use to make bread at home, well, a similar kind took a trip to the moon. We'll tell you what it could mean for humans in space, but first. That's, that's so much money. CBC's Marketplace unveils exactly how much more Canadians pay for their cell phone bill compared to other countries. Next. It is no secret Canada has some of the highest cell phone bills in the world, but what do Canadians pay versus what they get as compared to other countries? Well, brace yourself for a bit of a shock. David Common and our colleagues at Marketplace looked into how Canadian wireless bills stack up. Hi, Isabel. Hi, Australia. Hi, how are you? I'm well. Here's a little illustration to show you how much more we pay for cell service than countries around the world. Okay, and we set the timer. Okay, great. We asked Isabel in Australia to do some video downloads, scroll on social, all using her cell data, not Wi-Fi. We're going to calculate how much data you use, and then we'll compare that to how much the same kind of task would cost here in Canada. We base this on rates calculated by Rewheel, a respected global research outfit. And the gap? Well, it's pretty big. The download of Wednesday on Netflix. Mm -hmm. The average user in Australia would pay $1.63 for that. Mm -hmm. By comparison, the average user in Canada, $10.22. Oh my God. That's, that's so much money. It's just pretty scary that that's, that's your normal there in Canada. In fact, Australians generally pay 85% less per gigabyte than Canadians. We chose Australia because, like Canada, its small population is spread out across a vast country. We are right in here. Longtime NDP MP Brian Massey has looked for ways to cut Canadian cell bills for years. And Australia, he says, is a model we should follow. There's much more consumer protection in Australia than there is in Canada. That's where we're falling down. We get the short end of the stick every single time. Hello, Ireland. Hi, Theo. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm very well. Ireland is another interesting comparison. We ran the same test with Theo. And where we pay dollars for something, they pay pennies and have many different providers to choose from. It's a free-for-all. It's like a buffet of phone activities. <laughs> It didn't used to be that way in Ireland. They had a near monopoly. Then the government changed the rules to make it easier for companies without their own infrastructure to compete with ones that do. So new providers came in, cell service rates plummeted. They're now 95% less than Canada. Are you serious? That big of a difference? What's going on here with two towers, same site? Well, unfortunately, <laughs> Canada is one of the only countries in the world that hasn't figured out how to share towers. Anthony Lacavera paid the price for that. Years ago, he planned to be Canada's disruptor and his win mobile, he says, helped bring cell phone prices down until war with the big players became too much. We shared one tower success. One. One. And so Even though it's supposed to be? Mandated tower sharing. 
they were really able to put up a lot of barriers. Canadians are suffering under some of the highest prices for telecom services in the world, and it's because we're allowing these oligopolies to continue to function and to consolidate even further. We can't fault them for that. We have to have the government step in and fix this once and for all. So, David, given all that, what happens here if that potential massive Roger Shaw deal goes through? Okay, is it good for competition? Really is what's at issue here. The two companies that want to become one, they say it'll be good for competition, but don't get me to explain how. The Competition Bureau has said they think it'll be bad for competition. There's something called a competition tribunal that says they think it'll be okay. Who gets to decide? The federal government, perhaps as soon as the end of this month. Okay, so that's entirely out of our hands, mm -hmm. but, but I suspect getting a better deal is it. W what do you do? That is in your hands, and how to do it, figure out what you need. Like, don't pay for more data than you need. Also, figure out what else is out there. Go to the competitors and see what they will offer you. Then call up your provider, invest the time. It may take hours. You may need to threaten to cancel your service unless you get the deal that the other competitor is offering. It may take some time, end of the month, end of the year, always a good time to do this, but you can do it. Always a lot of work, too. David, thank you. Thank you. And to see David's full-length story, The People versus the Phone Giants, Catch Marketplace, Friday night, 8 p.m. on CBC Gem and CBC Television, 8.30, of course, in Newfoundland. These amateur relic hunters found not a fork in the road, but dozens in the woods. This never happens. It's a whole stash. Discover their buried treasure in our moment. A Canadian scientist is leading the hunt to solve a major hurdle in deep space exploration. It's not building bigger or faster rockets, but how to keep astronauts safe in space. As Kurt Petrovich shows us, it involves a common kitchen ingredient and an incredible journey. Three, two, one, boosters in ignition. These guys here just traveled two million kilometers and they came back. And that's just the beginning. When NASA's Artemis One lifted off from the launch pad in November, there was no crew, but there were passengers, a colony of thousands, yeast cells, carefully prepared at the University of British Columbia by a scientist who was just a child when the last astronaut set foot on the moon. If there was one word, it would, say, it would be proud. Proud like a parent. Nislo's lab-borne progeny are the same kind you might find in a jar at home, with one important difference. He created 6,000 genetically unique versions to test how they responded to cosmic radiation that bombarded the spacecraft. Cosmic radiation wreaks havoc on human DNA, causing everything from cataracts to cancer. Most yeast genes function just like ours. This is pure motivation. It really is. There is perhaps no obstacle to long duration human spaceflight more formidable than cosmic radiation. And it could be that one of the oldest life forms on the planet helps the most sophisticated move beyond it. It's an amazing time in history. Chris Hatfield spent nearly six months aboard the International Space Station, the longest of any Canadian astronaut. But in low Earth orbit, Hadfield was largely shielded from cosmic radiation by the Earth's magnetic field. Future destinations, the Moon and Mars, are outside that protective cloak. Hadfield says Nislo's work is vital. And from that, then we can start to understand what does cause the cancers? What, what types of radiation are we most susceptible to? Nislo thinks the answer may be an mRNA shot working like a COVID-19 vaccine that will activate a radiation-fighting protein in astronauts. There are months of analysis ahead to find a path to the stars in something from a pantry. Kurt Petrovich, CBC News, Vancouver. So cool. From up in space, let's go down to Earth and right into the dirt. What you are looking at is not your grandma's silverware. This is buried treasure hidden under layers of soil for nearly a century. So a pair of amateur relic hunters in Vancouver discovered the bounty stamped with a historic logo and they found it in a secret wooded location. Their epic score is our moment. This is the mother load of silverware. I brought Christian here to try and find this abandoned car. I'm out with uh, a new digger, Julian Hicks, and uh, he had a hot tip on uh, some stuff in the forest. It's just like the experience of reaching your hand in a hole and pulling out 
a bunch of close to 100 year old forks and knives. Uh, so we counted uh, 121 pieces. It's pretty amazing to actually have found this without any map or anything. So every single piece of this silverware has the Hotel Vancouver stamp on it. There's been three different Hotel Vancouvers and this would have had to belong to the latest and the newest from 1939. How in the hell did those things get there? We've basically come down to two conclusions. It was either put there purposely for somebody to find in the future, as we did, or it was somebody that stole it and stashed it for a rainy day, and then something happened to that person or they forgot about it. It was just, wow. It's, uh... Yeah, no kidding. This is the best story. So they did not use a metal detector. That's impressive. What do you do with 121 extra pieces of cutlery? I mean, 121 people aren't going to show up for dinner. So they're going to keep a set. They're going to give a set to the Hotel Vancouver for its archives. They might sell one. That is the National for January the 11th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.